funding. We're funded through the Delta Regional Authority, as well as um, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in the Health, in the health Resources and Services Administration. And here's where we are in the plan for this program. We are in the middle, this middle section here. Um, on set, we're in session five and the focus today is on accountability. So in the next session that we have two weeks from now, um, we'll be focusing on goal setting. We do have, well, when we initially planned this, we planned to kind of be together in person for session seven. We know that's not gonna happen. We're still working on the best fit plan for session seven and we'll have, we'll share that with you as soon as we have it. And when we have that plan, um, the deadline for having that plan, we'll be sharing it with you by the next session for sure. A couple of reminders about Zoom etiquette. We just ask if you that you stay muted if you're not speaking. Um, and then just unmute yourself if you wanna say something or if you've got a question. And um, when we get into breakout sessions, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and stay unmuted the whole time so that you can have a good conversation. And that is all I have. Bill, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Shannon. And it's great to see everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me, I hope everyone was, uh, even with things being as hectic as they are, I hope everyone was able to have a, uh, a nice Thanksgiving time. It seems like it's been forever since we were all together again, but maybe that's just because of my world, uh, nothing else. Uh, today we are going to talk about accountability. Hopefully my rapidly spinning through those slides didn't make anybody dizzy or anything. Uh, don't worry, that's not, a, that's not a symptom of COVID if you see Bill's slides flashing quickly before your eyes. So no need, need for worry there. Uh, so today uh, we're in module five, accountability. But first of all, I need to let you know that my opinions are my opinions. And what I teach is based on my research, not the US government's. So I need to put this disclaimer in here uh, for your information. Now, before we get into accountability, I wanted to ask it that when we ended our last session, our last session was on not difficult conversations, on opportunity conversations, right? And I shared with you the PAIRS model, P-A-R-E-S. Prepare, ask, recognize, express, and solve. And I threw out a, a, a request, if you will, that to try to use one of those letters uh, when you had an opportunistic conversation with someone uh, before we met again. And meeting again is today. So did anybody uh, try uh, any aspect of, of that pairs model in having an opportunistic conversation with someone? If you did, just unmute yourself, if you don't mind, and, and share what happened. So either that means that no one tried it or I'm gonna, no. I'm so, going to be honest with you. Yes. Like the day after our last session. Yes. Hit the fan and hit us in the face full force. And um, so the last thing I was thinking of was preparing for difficult conversations. I was just diving right into those bad boys. <laughs> so you, you weren't turning them into opportunities? There was there was no time to turn anything into an opportunity. <laughs> we were making chicken salad out of chicken shit the last two okay. weeks. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Amy. All right, I was going to say either uh, no one tried it or if you tried it, you didn't survive uh, uh, to tell the story. So uh, maybe a little bit of, of both, but uh, I understand that. Well, uh, hopefully you were able to retain some of that and uh, we'll be able to use that at the appropriate time to have an opportunity conversation. Uh, and today we want to talk about accountability. Now, uh, I don't know who somebody's unmuted. Uh, uh, I don't know if some of if that's something you can take care of, but there's a little bit of background noise uh, taking place. Uh, so if you could each check that or some of if you could check that as well. When we talk about accountability today, 
I want to talk about three different aspects of accountability. I want to talk about a little bit about the history, looking back, uh, you know, where does accountability come from, what I consider to be a traditional accountability, and then what I consider to be true accountability. And uh, I'm going to ask for your assistance in having these conversations. I always think it's good to <clears throat> look back when you or talk about any topic to get a historical perspective of, of where it comes from. And so when I researched accountability and its origins, uh, here is, is uh, uh, what I found out. Accountability really comes from this, the org chart, right? Everybody recognize the org chart? I bet you have one at uh, somewhere at Marshall Browning Hospital. Uh, and you know, an org chart helps delineate who reports to who, who does what and all that sort of thing. Who, does anybody have a guess on where org charts uh, or organizational charts uh, originated? Any guesses? You can use the chat function if you want or unmute yourself, whatever works. Any guesses or anybody know? Well, what I found out when I researched this, an organizational chart comes from the Roman Empire days with the Roman armies. Uh, they, uh, for the Roman armies, uh, so at the top of the org chart, guess who that was? It was the general, right? And then next you had the lieutenants, and then you had the equivalent of the infantrymen. So at, if you think about that, the person who put this idea together, the org chart, who do you think they assumed the smartest person was? Where did they put the smartest person? Well, they put them at the top. So the assumption was that the general was the smartest person and had the greatest perspective, the best knowledge base, the best decision maker. So was anybody here in the military? If you were, if you could unmute yourself and answer this question, are generals the smartest people? No veterans willing to answer that question? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the idea was that the smartest person would be at the top here and they would tell the lieutenants what to do. And the lieutenants were very good at uh, following instructions. So they would in turn tell the people below them, here's what you need to do. And here's how you need to do it. So the, the, the premise was that the smartest person was at the top and the people who did all the heavy lifting were at the bottom and they weren't able to think, uh, they weren't even required to think because they were just simply told what to do and the assumption was that they would blindly do that. Now, I don't know if anybody has ever followed the automotive industry in the United States, but uh, in, in my lifetime, uh, it's changed dramatically. You know, we used to have, they still call them the big three here in the United States, General Motors, Ford, and, and Chrysler. Um, but does anybody remember when uh, Toyota built a plant? They built one in Princeton, Indiana, right? Just on the other side of the Wabash River. Then they built one down in uh, Tennessee. I forget where it is in Tennessee, but those were the first Japanese automotive companies uh, plants in the United States. And um, having lived most of my adult life in Michigan, uh, I got to know people in the tool and die trade. In fact, this one guy, the company he worked for, believe it or not, they, they made a lot of money. They don't even make them anymore. <clears throat> Remember when car doors had those plastic locks that you would pull up and down and you could screw them off uh, the, the metal interior piece. Uh, so they made door lock, plastic door lock things. And, uh, but they sold them to the big three automotive companies. And so he said every year when they came out with the new models, the tradition was that they, the engineering teams would get all the parts manufacturers, a representative from each one of them to come in. You would usually sit outside the conference room for a couple of hours waiting to get in to see them. And then once you got in to see them, they would spend the next two hours telling you why your product stunk, why it was terrible, why it, you need to make all these changes and improvements. And it was a very arduous process, as you might imagine. So then when Toyota came to the United States, 
his this guy's company they they got a contract with them for some small part i think it was for the seat lever or something like that and so he went to the plant to see, introduce the part to the engineers assuming it would take on the same process and when he arrived that he actually realized that they had sent him not to a boardroom but to the manufacturing facility itself and uh the he went up to the engineers and they said oh we don't want to talk to you what you need to do is go to uh this station on the assembly line where your part is added and work with the employees on the assembly line we're going to do a, a test run where uh, the car is going to come down the assembly line and you help your guys put on your part that was it and he when he said when he came home he said he knew that the uh, big three auto companies were in for a tough ride because of the innovation of these Japanese automakers because they didn't have an org chart like this. They started at the bottom of this with the worker bees, if you will, because uh, they knew that those people had firsthand knowledge about what worked and what didn't work. So it wasn't the flow down structure uh, anymore. But the origins of the organizational chart uh, come from a long, long time ago. And uh, things have changed since then, but there are benefits to having uh, a structure like this because when you have a hierarchical structure like this, it, it does help the leader to maintain control. Uh, you can argue whether uh, this position at the top of the org chart is the smartest person in the room, so to speak. Uh, everyone has knowledge and skills that they bring to the table, but the bottom line is when you have a structure like that through a hierarchy, the leader does maintain control and the leader also manages accountability. And that's what we're talking about today, accountability, uh, because everything has to come to the leader at the top of the org chart. And uh, it also helps separate responsibilities for who does what. You know, the assembly line workers in the, the car uh, uh, example, um, they put stuff on the car, they put parts on the car. They don't have to make strategic planning decisions or uh, decide who they buy parts from or what the sales price is or what the marketing plan. Uh, it, so there are benefits of an hier hierarchical structure. Um, but what happens is your organization gets bigger and there's more and more tasks the managing accountability gets to be a bigger and bigger task because you have more and more people coming to you saying and, and more things that you have to keep people accountable for and it can become an insurmountable task. So that's the history of accountability as as uh, as demonstrated through the research that I did. And, and so what I'd like to talk about now is a traditional accountability. Uh, what I mean by traditional accountability is who has ever asked or made this statement? We need to pe hold people more accountable around here. So Seneva, we have a poll uh, to ask this question, uh, yes or no. Have you ever said we need to hold people more accountable? So the responses are coming in. Okay, let's uh, stop and share. Okay. Everybody <laughs> on this call has said, we need to hold people more accountable around here. Okay. So th that's what I expected actually, uh, making that statement or having that thought because it's a natural thought to have. And today, this is one of the things when, on our first call that we had, when you were asked, what are some of the things you wanna take away from this program? Holding others accountable was one of the main topics, that and having difficult conversations, which we uh, talked about last week. And holding others accountable and having opportunistic conversations are very, very much related. And everybody has had this thought, we need to hold people more accountable around here. So if you wanna hold people more accountable, guess what? It starts with you. You know, oftentimes we get, 
one of the reasons we say we got to hold people more accountable around here is because we're, we're upset with somebody because they haven't done something that they should have done. Uh, and so, uh, like so many things, uh, the first thing you have to do is look in the mirror when someone hasn't done something that you would wanted them to do. And you need to ask yourself a few questions. The first question to ask yourself is, have you been clear? Have you, do, does the other person that you're wanting them to be accountable for something, do they know exactly what you were expecting? Uh, did you make that clear to them beyond a shadow of a doubt? And then uh, did you ask them, you know, hey, how can I help you do this? Because sometimes we think people know how to do something and they're not sure or they don't even have a clue sometimes, but they don't want to admit that. Uh, or sometimes they know exactly what to do. But if you can ask them, uh, do you need any help? What can I do to be of help? That can make a big difference for them. And if they say no, OK, at least you ask them that and got that out of the way. But then sometimes, you know, what if, what if it's a bit of a challenge? Did you take the time to uh, come up with some ideas uh, to uh, think of uh, a way to uh, take whatever task it is, take it on? Uh, is there a unique way, a faster way, a better way? Uh, did you take time to talk about ideas on how to get this done? If it's a routine thing, OK. Uh, but sometimes we can't assume that even the most tenured of employees knows how to do routine things unless they've done it uh, before. And if they've done it before and they're not doing it now, that means something is in the way uh, preventing them from doing that. And then uh, the, another question is, did you build a plan of action with the person that you're wanting to hold accountable? Uh, so in other words, you know, I need you to get that report done by the end of the day Friday, if not sooner. Uh, so again, it goes back up to the expectations. Uh, if you need help, uh, you can go see Amy. Uh, you know, she's going to be off on Friday, so make sure you see her before Friday. Otherwise, she's not going to be here to help you with that. And so just helping lay out the uh, steps uh, needed to complete whatever task it is at hand. Uh, otherwise, how are you going to hold them accountable if you didn't do these things? Now, once you have uh, are trying to hold someone accountable, sometimes you need to have an opportunistic conversation with them, right? Uh, which everyone knows how to do. Use the pairs. Uh, the main thing is you need to create a safe environment where you can have these opportunistic conversations, where you can set the expectations. You can go through that whole list of questions that we just went over to make sure that if they're not sure, they know that they can speak up without ramifications on getting something done. Uh, make sure that there's clarity and agreement and track the progress, measure the progress. Because if you don't track it, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. So sometimes we get upset with someone feeling like they're not being accountable uh, when we haven't tracked or and we forgot to follow up with them as well. Uh, we just kind of delegated it and forgot about it until the deadline hit. And they were saying, what the hell? We need to hold more people more accountable around here. Uh, so we have a big investment in making this happen. So to track and measure progress, there's a lot of different ways you can you can do this, uh, you know, uh, you can write up, uh, you know, job descriptions, typical example, but writing up uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, keeping scorecards. Um, one of the things I do when I work with a hospital on strategic planning is using balanced scorecards, uh, which were developed by the National, uh, National Rural Health Resource Center to uh, measure outcomes of uh, so scorecards are big, uh, always giving feedback, you know, checking in with them. You can also give them feed forward suggestions in the future, you know, some kind of a, a dashboard to track performance or uh, during whatever kind of meetings you might have, uh, 
whether it's weekly, daily, monthly, whatever, to make sure you're on the same page uh, and writing things up, using checklists, uh, making plans. So there's lots of different ways. None of this is new to any of you, I'm sure, you know, that you can track and measure progress to hold others accountable. But any questions uh, before I go into true account, what I consider true accountability? Questions, comments by anyone? You can either use a chat function or unmute yourself to speak up. Okay, so what do I mean when I say true accountability? I believe that holding other people accountable is a myth. I don't think you can hold other people accountable. I don't expect all of you to agree with me on this, but I want to take a little bit of a different twist on accountability in what I consider is true accountability. If you are supposed to do something, let's say, Heather, if you are supposed to get a report done by the end of the day on Thursday, who holds Heather the most accountability? Is it someone else or is it Heather? it's you right exactly and so I believe that that's the most powerful type of accountability is accountability of self uh, I have accountability and I will make sure things get done is a myth when you apply it to other people but it, when it comes to you you hold yourself more accountable than anybody else can. Most people I know, uh, especially that work in rural health, if you screw up and don't get something done, there's no one that's going to be harder on you than you. And uh, there's some reasons for that. But one question I have for you is, what was the best team you were ever a member of? And so when I ask you that question, what I mean is, it doesn't have to be at Marshall Browning Hospital. It doesn't have to be at any hospital. It could be back, it could be today, it could be in the past. Uh, you know, it could have been a sports team in high school or when you were a kid. It could have been a church group or a, being in the band. It could be a service organization. It could be your team at work, whatever. But what was the best team you were ever a member of? And why do you think of it as the best team you were ever a member of? What made it the best team? So this is a, a kind of a thoughtful question. And I want to put you all in breakout rooms to talk about this, to share with each other what was the best team you were ever a member of and why was it the best team you were ever a member of? So um, Seneva has gotten in the festive spirit and renamed the uh, breakout rooms after Christmas trees. So we have uh, the Douglas fir, the balsam fir, the Fraser fir, the white fir, and the blue spruce breakout rooms. Doesn't that sound festive? You can almost smell the evergreen branches as we talk about that. So um, for this first breakout session, I'd like for you to share with each other what the, was the best team you were ever a member of and why it was your best team. And I'm going to ask whoever in your breakout room has the oldest grandchild will run the conversation. Now, if no one has grandchildren, whoever has the oldest child can do it. And if no one has child, grandchildren or children, we'll just say the oldest person in the group can run the conversation. And so share with each other, what was the best team that you were ever a member of? And then pick one of those stories when we come back together and share that with the group. What was the best team one of the people in your group were a member of and why was it the best team? Okay, Seneva, can you put everybody in the breakout group? Mm -hmm. um, and Bill and Shannon, you can just decline when it asks you to join. It um, included you guys in these ones, so you can just decline it. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm looking forward to hearing about the best team experiences. Uh, let's start with the balsam fur uh, group. Hi. Okay. That was our group. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So that was our group. There were three of us in the group. And um, we, you know, kind of talked about um, different teams maybe we'd been on. Um, I'm the oldest and I have the oldest grandchild, of course. So, um, and he's 23 and in medical school. So I kind of trumped the whole thing there. Um, so we talked about different teams. I personally couldn't remember my high school team stuff. So we had to move on. And we, so we kind of talked about different jobs maybe or different um, uh, roles that we held in different jobs and different things and environments we worked in. And um, what was the best qualities, you know, what we really liked, you know. So one of the things was being able to work together, you know, um, people with that are a little upbeat, have good personalities, you know, um, that would help each other. Uh, people who really wanted to come to work and work together or um, work as the same team. We all thought that uh, clear communication made it easier to work together. Um, trusting who you work with. That is a really, really big thing is trust in the people that you work with or trust in the people of the team to do you know, things. Um, we talked about roles. Um, we talked about people doing their part because in any team, you know, um, it's kind of hard when one person's running around chasing the ball and the other one's sitting on the bench, you know, and you have that in healthcare sometimes. So we talked about that. We talked about, you know, like I said, working with up, more upbeat personalities and personalities that bond. And we kind of talked about working with crabby apples and how that's not fun. Yeah. So um, those were just some of the things like that we discussed because, um, you know, um, your work environment is your team, you know? Um, so that's just kind of what we talked about. Okay. Thank you, Grandma Sandra. <laughs> Got her into medical school. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, one in medical school, one in aviation, one in computer science, and there's more I could go on. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How about the uh, Fraser Fur group? Uh, yeah, I believe that's us. Um, we, we talked about work teams. Um, one person had work, you know, worked in work team and talked about the involvement and participation and knowing, just knowing that they were making an impact. Um, we talked about like a hospital team, like the healthcare team that we had here and just lots of departments involved and just realizing that, you know, everybody had something to offer that, um, that was different than, and a lot of, a lot of the people realized that they didn't know so much about the other departments, you know. Um, we, we talked about sports teams a little bit, just the trust that you have to have for the players and um, realizing that if you're not in the top five, that the team still couldn't be a team without you. And um, just a department team, you know, where everybody does have the commonality and um, being able to know if you're not there, the next person's going to step in for you and, and help you out. Sure. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, how about the white fur team? We were white pine, is that what I have mean? white pine. Oh, white pine, I'm sorry. I, I I can't even read my own writing here. White pine team. Is white pine a Christmas tree, Cinova? Come on, I never heard of a white pine being a Christmas tree. Okay. <laughs> white pines, I defer. Okay. Um, so we have a team of three also. And okay. um, first we had discussed being on uh, like personal teams, school teams, stuff like that. And of course, Amy's avid and, and pa has passion for her football team. And uh, uh, Heather wasn't involved in the, the school aspect teams. However, she is like the organizational 
leader of, of everything, which lends to being a great team. So when we, we got into different teams and we come back to work, um, that's what we discussed. And um, what we come up with was um, to have the qualities needed to have a great team, you definitely have to have organization. You have to be able to click with one another and be able to have disagreements and disagree on things without having hurt feelings. Um, we also said that um, we need a common goal. The teams that have been successful for us, we all have the same common goal and that everybody actually does what they are supposed to be doing to make the team successful. And that's what we said. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, White Pines, not White Furs. Thank you. Uh, how about the Blue Spruce gang? Um, that was us. We had three on our, in our group also. Okay. Um, one discussed her, her work team. Um, she works with a group of women, women, and, um, is very happy that in her department, they get along and there is not a lot of drama, which helps make a team be successful. And especially with it being a bunch of women, that's, that's a big plus. <laughs> Um, one said that his, um, senior football team, um, his senior year, his football team, um, that they have, he said probably 75% of them have still stayed good friends and kept up their friendship, which, you know, that's, you usually lose track or contact with a lot of people you have gone to school with. Um, and then, um, we, one of them brought up family, that their family is their um, best team um, that it's they're there their biggest cheerleaders there to pick up the pieces when the bottom falls out and help help um, put it all back together so great thank you uh, I think that just leaves the Douglas furs that was our group and we were we had two groups from school and Two talked about uh, work, the teams that they work with here at work being great. The, the school ones were a band and a basketball. And here at work, it was a, a crew that we worked with day in and day out and a crew that went above and beyond and helped with special events. And what kind of makes those teams work is you have to have a common goal, know what the desired end result is and trusting that each will do their best to reach that, that end goal. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so some interesting dynamics, uh, interesting teams, you know, uh, from family to sports teams to work teams, uh, all the, in the notes that I took, trust was certainly a recurring theme, uh, as well as having a common goal, making an impact, uh, clicking with one another, the ability to agree or disagree without there being a bunch of drama associated with that. For for me, the best team I was ever a member of was uh, someone, I'm not sure who, uh, it was my high school football team. Uh, you know, the McLeansboro Foxes were never known for having a great football team, but uh, I certainly uh, uh, love being a member of that team uh, my senior year in particular where, you know, we we all held each other accountable. We had a dictator of a coach, but we all loved him. Uh, but the thing of it is we all held each other accountable. We'd get on each other when somebody would screw up. We'd say, what the heck are you doing, man? You were out of position or whatever. But it was okay to do that. Uh, and it was also okay to pat each other on the back and give recognition for a job well done as well. And that a lot of that evolved around trust. So, you know, some recurring themes on what makes the best team ever. And I would in, like to say that holding each other accountable is a big part of that. And when you look at engaged teams, uh, there's six characteristics that have I've identified. Uh, there's functional 
characteristics, which uh, means that there's a clear purpose. There is an accepted purpose. And that's one of the things that one of you talked about in, in your group is having a common goal and clear expectations. You know what your purpose was and what you were supposed to do. And being able to measure those results to make sure that you are achieving your purpose it was, uh, you could say for most of these uh, ways you described your ideal team, uh, that was part of it. Not in all of them, but in some of them. And when we're talking about sports teams, of course, there's a score, right? <laughs> or uh, uh, other statistics that are tracked. Uh, but in a, a highly engaged team from a functional perspective, everybody on the team knows what to do and they know how to do it. And that was uh, stated in some of the descriptions of the best team that you were on too, because that helps you trust each other, right? And you have a shared fate. The uh, shared fate is that you know that if the team does well, uh, you're all going to do well. If the team doesn't do well, well, that that's going to suck for everybody. Uh, so having these common characteristics from a functional point of view are a big part of what engaged teams are all about. Now, when it comes specifically to being accountable, that means that when there are issues, the team deals with it. And that was one of the things that was pointed out when you can, uh, by one of you, uh, you can either agree or disagree within the best team that you were part of, but that was okay. It's okay to agree or disagree because if there's an issue, it needs to be dealt with as a team without a lot of drama to use uh, some, uh, as someone's uh, said. So holding each other accountable <clears throat> is a big part of what an engaged team is and the ultimate success is that everyone on the team is committed to each other's success and when you do that that's why you can say hey uh, you know you were out of position there you got to make sure that you are in proper position when that happens because uh, if you don't <laughs> it's not going to lead to our success and conversely you were in perfect position and that's how we're going to be successful as a team. And everyone is committed to that success as a team. No one is grandstanding, uh, taking credit for what the team has accomplished because it is truly a team effort. Now that team effort, part of me doesn't even like the word team because t the word team gets overused so much. Oftentimes we use teams to uh, synonymously with the term groups, uh, or as team indicates that there's some kind of co connectedness that you want to belong, uh, whereas a group is just that, a group of people that have been put together. Uh, whereas a highly functional uh, team, a highly engaged team is truly committed to everyone's success that are members of the team. Any questions or, or comments on these characteristics of an engaged team? You can either use the uh, chat function or unmute yourself if you have a question or comment. All right, well, let's uh, move to the next page. So the uh, if you want to move from a functional team to an accountable team, there's some steps that you can take to do this. The first thing is that if you are the leader of that team, you got to be willing to give up some control. For some leaders, that's next to impossible. For other leaders, it's easy. Uh, for other leaders, it's uneasy. So everyone has a different way of dealing with that. But if you want to truly have a highly uh, functioning, highly, uh, but highly accountable team, you have to be willing to give up some control. Uh, but to do that, you, you got to make sure you remember those questions that uh, 
I suggested that you ask yourself when you're trying to hold others accountable. These are kind of what those questions were. Uh, do you have a clearly defined purpose? Do you have metrics to measure your progress and to make sure you're moving towards achieving that purpose? Do you have goals in alignment with the purpose? And are there clear, clear roles, clear responsibilities, and everyone understands uh, authority and who has authority and who doesn't? And is there a team leader, a true team leader? And is there a maturity of the team? So that uh, just like in the one example of, uh, you know, you can agree and you can disagree, but there's not drama associated with it because it's okay to agree and disagree. Uh, so it takes maturity to do that with along with a high degree of a shared fate. Uh, once you can encompass um, these different uh, characteristics, you can truly move towards being an accountable team. Now, a lot of this comes from uh, a, a gentleman back at the turn of the century. I've only read his name, so I'm not sure if, how to pronounce it. I say Bayans. That was his last name. He was uh, from the UK. Uh, Bayans theory of herd. Now, when I hear herd, uh, being a country boy from Southern Illinois, I think I've heard of dairy cattle since I used to work on a dairy farm. Uh, but actually what he was looking at were basically elephants in the uh, jungles of Africa. And what he did is he looked at how uh, herds of elephants behaved, especially during times of stress. And then he took those principles and applied them to human beings. And so based on his theory of herd, he made these four uh, assumptions about human behavior. For one thing, he believes that humans are basically pack animals. We like to be together as a group. I mean, if you think about the, the early days of humankind, you know, you needed to be in a pack of other human beings to survive. And that's still true today. I mean, you hear of people that we call them names, hermits, right? Those are people that are loners all by themselves, but those are few and far between. Uh, we need each other. And uh, as, for, as far as Bayan's theory of herd goes, individual action is a myth. And then when we look at uh, human beings as groups, it's really a mental thing. It's not that there's a clear cut group, uh, you know, like being part of a sports team, being part of a church group, being part of a work team. Uh, that relationship is more mental than anything. And that connection to the group is a mental exercise that we go through because in, in the chorus of uh, aspects, it's a requirement for human survival. Uh, so these are taking Bayan's theory of, of herd behavior and applying it to human beings, saying that we need each other to survive and thrive. It's not an individual process. So what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, in a group setting, uh, a lot of the times our behavior is driven by being, a, con, being afraid, quite frankly, that we're gonna be pushed out of the group. The, there, we're no longer gonna, the group's not gonna want us to be part of the group. And so we behave accordingly so that we are embraced as a member of the group. Fear of separation is very powerful. Uh, then there is a high degree of relationship between creativity and the function of the team with low level fear of separation. So in other words, the more you can problem solve as a group, as a team, uh, and try th something new, uh, that makes you feel more of that spirit of being a team and less likely to be concerned about being pushed out, being separated from the team. Uh, now, as the leader, you have to be focused on uh, creating an environment that allows for this connection to take place 
and people don't have to be worried about being separated from the team. So creating that environment or that culture is an important element of this. And, and you can minimize the fear of separation by making sure that the group or the team deals with its issues in a group setting. Not taking someone off to the side, but having the group, having the team deal with issues as a team. Now, that's hard to embrace sometimes. Uh, and But for if you think about those highly functioning teams that you all just talked about and described to each other, I would guess that, and based on the descriptions that you gave, the team dealt with the real issues that the team was faced with in a group setting. So there are five different ways that you can address real issues. Well, ignoring them, okay? <laughs> you can ignore when someone does something, if they don't get a report done on time, they don't do what they're supposed to do, whatever it is, you can ignore it. Uh, and I would guess that if we had a poll question right now uh, and I ask, have you ever ignored uh, an employee or a team member who didn't get something done? I would guess that if everyone was honest, everyone would say, yes, I've ignored a problem. And so when you do ignore, okay, your anxiety goes down because you don't have to do anything. You just got to ignore it, right? But for that employee, uh, when we're talking about a work environment, that employee knows that they did something wrong and they know that they didn't get the report done on time, whatever, and no one said anything about it. So do you think that increases their fear of separation? Did they, did, they, did she not see, did she know I didn't, didn't get that done? Uh, or isn't she gonna say anything? Or maybe she's gonna say something at my performance review. So when you ignore something, that does lower your anxiety level uh, because you don't have to do anything, but it can increase that fear of separation from the individual that is not being held accountable. Now, another thing that you can do is you can talk behind that person's back. Can you believe Shannon didn't get that report done? Oh my God, she is so bad, I can't believe it. So when you have that conversation and talk behind somebody else's back to another person, what are you telling that other person? You're telling them that you talk about people behind their back, right? So how are they ever gonna trust you? And trust was one of the biggest recurring themes on the best teams that you've ever been a member of. So when you talk behind someone's back, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun. Let's admit it, it's kind of fun to have those talk behind the gossip, talk behind the back gossipy conversation. So that can re really reduce our anxiety, but the person that it's targeting that can increase their fear of separation from the group. Another way you can handle this is you can go to the boss. Say, hey, you know, I'm not gonna deal with this. Shannon didn't get a report on time. I'm gonna go tell Dan, let Dan deal with it. Okay, well, you can do that. Uh, but, you know, you don't, that decreases your anxiety because you didn't have to do anything, but and when Dan calls Shannon in to talk to her, that's going to increase her fear of separation, I would guess. Uh, plus, when you go to the boss and let the boss handle th things, uh, uh, accountability situations or any kind of difficult situation, after a while, what's the boss going to think about you? Man, uh, Bill can't handle anything because he's always sending people my way because he's not handling it. So it makes me question, why in the heck do I have him in this leadership role? So going to the boss like sometimes might not be a bad idea, but you got to be careful on overusing that one. Now, another way, and this is probably the most common way I hear of uh, leaders and supervisors and managers dealing with uh, performance, uh, a lack of accountability, uh, by an individual is just pull them aside and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And that's where you get to practice your opportunistic conversations, right? Uh, by having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, when you do that, we all know that jacks our anxiety up because we don't like 
uh, some of us don't like conflict at all, let alone having an opportunistic conversation. And for those of you who haven't reframed it, a difficult conversation that increases our anxiety. But for the recipient of that, you know, it may or may not, uh, it may increase their fear of separation. It may decrease their fear of separation. Not sure, but at least it's getting dealt with. So they, it's not an unknown thing uh, and it's out in the open. And the final way, except my numbering system is off, that should be a five, uh, is a group or a community cure where the team takes on accountability with one of its members uh, as a team together. Now, when you do that, yes, that increases your anxiety as a leader because you're, you're giving up control here. You're letting the team deal with it. But when it's done appropriately, it can truly reduce the fear of separation. And so we go back to the uh, Bion's theory of herd. It's the fear of separation that makes the big difference for highly accountable, highly engaged teams. So the more we can reduce the fear of separation by team members, the more accountable, the more engaged our teams will be. And if you think back to those teams you described as the best team you were ever a member of, I would, uh, I would guess that those teams fit into this uh, final uh, last category here. Uh, of dealing with accountability uh, and reducing the fear of separation by dealing with it as a team. So when I present this concept, a lot of people, uh, they get that ignoring probably isn't the best way to deal with accountability issues. Talking behind someone's back is not the best way. Going to the boss, yeah, I get it. You know, sometimes I may have to do that. I need to do as much of that on my own as I can. The majority want to do it one on one. And I get that as well. And there is pushback on doing this group or community or team cure, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that's, that's where I want to challenge you and push you to is considering this as an option for your team. So I created what I call an accountability checklist and you should have received this as a handout. And so all this is, is a list of questions that goes back to what we were talking about uh, at, at the beginning of this presentation. So when you are, you know you need to hold someone accountable. Have you been clear about your expectations? Yes, no, not sure. Have you asked what you can do to help? Yes, no, not sure. Have you taken time to brainstorm and review processes? And have you built a plan of action with your team member? Now, in, when you use this checklist, uh, hopefully your answer will be yes on all these uh, because no or not sure are essentially the same thing. If you're not sure if you did that, if you're not sure that you were clear about your expectations, Odds are you weren't clear about your expectations, okay? Uh, so uh, the goal is to make sure you can use this checklist to, that you can give yourself yeses on all these questions. And then how to address, uh, do you ignore it? Do you talk behind the back? Do you transition this situation over to the boss? Do you deal with it one-on-one? -on -one? Or do you have your team deal with it as a, as a team? Uh, in a team situation. And by going through this process, this gives you your action plan on what you need to do when you feel like someone needs to be held accountable. So you should each have this uh, handout, this checklist. And I want to go into breakout rooms again. And if you'll take the first couple of minutes to quickly share a situation where you need to hold someone accountable, all right? And if you uh, are having trouble thinking of uh, a situation that you need to deal with right now, think of one that you've recently dealt with. And then pick one of those situations and work through this accountability checklist on how you would proceed with this new information that you've received today. 
and, and how you would deal with that. So that's, that's the idea of the breakout session. Share uh, a situation where you need to hold someone accountable and work through this check, pick one from your group, work through this checklist. And then what I want you to do is then present the situation you dealt with and going through the checklist and how you would proceed after going through this process. Now, all these conversations are confidential. So, you know, whatever you talk about in your breakout rooms, when you're talking about people specific issues uh, that we do need to maintain a high level of confidentiality. I know I don't need to say that, but I feel better having said that because I want to make sure I'm clear about my expectations in this exercise uh, to make sure that uh, we're not violating any trust issues with anyone. So for uh, this breakout session, again, uh, do a quick round table of uh, examples of uh, someone you need to hold accountable or if you don't have any current accountability issues, some uh, a recent one that you've dealt with already, and then pick one of those from your group and work through this accountability checklist on how you would proceed if you were starting fresh with this newfound information. So the uh, for the breakout groups, uh, the leader of the conversation will be the person who has been married the shortest amount of time. So if you're single, you're off the hook. Uh, but if there, if in your group, no one has been, uh, is married at all, uh, then you can uh, flip a coin to see who <laughs> leads the conversation. Uh, so again, use the accountability checklist. We'll be in the breakout rooms for 10 minutes, then come back and share. All right. Seneva, can you make the breakout room magic happen? Yeah. Okay, everyone should be back. Yes, you can always tell when the time runs out because the numbers jump. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so the goal here was to take a situation, a real situation where you either need to hold someone accountable or you recently held someone accountable and work through this checklist, to use it to uh, figure out how to proceed. So. Uh, let's start with the Blue Spruce Gang. Uh, can you share, uh, work through the accountability checklist with us for your situation? Okay, did you say it was the one who had been married longest or shortest? I said the shortest, but what did you decide? I decided it should be the longest, but oh. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we... We didn't really ever come up with some any answers to all of these questions, but um, we we feel like definitely addressing it one on one is the best. Um, just by some personal experiences, to me, I feel like if if we sit down one on one and talk it out, hash it out, um, and then it's over and dropped and done, you know. Um, and as far as, you know, like being clear about expectations, um, just about a, a personal experience that I've had here in the office is with um, working with women and it's just the gossiping and things like that. Um, you know, I, what I have told my, my girls is that um, if you're gonna gossip, that's fine, but it's not to be addressed and hashed out while you're at work and that's something that if if someone has said something to you that you feel like is a problem that needs to be handled outside of work hours so yeah, gossip can be deadly um i know some leaders who out and outright say you know there can be no gossip around here there's no room for gossip because it can be so damaging um the problem but, with that though is you're not you're not there every waking hour of the day and on weekends yes. and things like that. I understand. I understand. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. So on the how to address the situation that you guys talked about, you decided that the one-on-one -on -one, uh, way to address was the way to address that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and as I shared with you, that seems to be the most common way that people want to deal with accountability issues. What was the, um, 
did you guys talk about dealing with it as a group or as a team? Brooke, did you guys talk about it in that way at all? You mean as far as the Holding, whole, whole department or? I'm, whatever I'm the whatever the situation was that you were talking about on holding someone accountable. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you talk about trying to do it as a group at all? Or you felt like one-on-one -on -one was a, a way to do it. I understand that. Did you consider handling it as a group? Um, I, I mean, handling as a group with the people involved. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not, not the whole not bringing the whole department into it, but the ones who's involved in it. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so that was the blue sprucers, right? And Brooke was married the shortest amount of time of the blue spruce gang. Okay. Uh, how about the Fraser fur group? All right, well, I don't know how I got lucky twice, but uh, it's me, and I've been married a year, so. All right. So we all could recall a scenario that has been in the recent past or ongoing, and I think what we came to the conclusion that probably the most important thing is your expectations. I mean that they're very clear because someone may not see it the way you do, and um, and then the one on one addressing it one on one. Um, Charlotte had a scenario where she's been working with the supervisor and um, not sure that it, it's getting back to the employee. And so she thinks she's going to do a one on one with each one of them okay. you know, to, to try to get the issue resolved. Um, you know, Harold felt like, you know, he needed to maybe be more clear on his expectations because maybe, you know, they weren't in the same place with the, okay. the expectations. Yeah, if you're not in the same place as far as expectation goes, it, odds are they're not going to do what you expect them to do. And then you're going to say, <laughs> we got to we got to hold some people accountable around here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, when I had a situation and really I didn't get anywhere until I had a action plan. Yeah. And okay. then all of a sudden it resolve itself. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, uh, Beth. And congratulations <laughs> on being uh, married the shortest amount of time and having the oldest grandchild. That's uh, oh, <laughs> quite an accomplishment there. All right. How about the uh, Douglas Fur Grant gang? <laughs> that was us. Um, so one situation we talked about that had come up uh, was I had a, a situation where I was um, out of town, like really, really far away for a couple weeks. Um, and I had a, um, a staff member that their PTO was going to max out and they found out like the day and then the next day they just told the person I had kind of left in charge, they were just going to take the day off and didn't uh, it wasn't something that was ran through anybody or any kind of heads up. So they ended up working shorthanded that day. So um, when I got back, um, I kind of got got together um, with HR and kind of uh, came up with a set of plans and, and what I and then what I wanted for myself for expectations about being able to take time off. Um, and then w instead of doing a one on one, so that way it didn't seem like it was kind of I mean, a few of the people kind of knew what had happened, but um, I ended up having a, a staff meeting where that was specifically addressed and I made sure that I told them that by X date of the month, I need to know for the next month, you know, your days off unless it's an emergency. Um, and uh, then I told them that I'd be willing to help them if they needed to get on and uh, we have an electronic system where it keeps track of all that. So if they didn't know how to log on or uh, that I could help facilitate that and show them that. Um, so I guess it was kind of a, a group um, addressing of the issue, but at the same time, it was um, in some ways addressing just that one person without addressing them. Uh, it, it, that way I could address future issues that might happen with, with other staff that would be similar at the same time. Sure. Yeah. And it sounds like, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that situation with us. So, uh, and some of the things that you were talking about doing, you're kind of going through that checklist at the very top there without 
explicitly saying that, but setting the expectations, how you can help by showing them how to log on, uh, uh, re review the process and all that sort of thing. And so when you did confront me, even though it, it sounds like you did a lot of the talking, but it was in front of the group, were, did other people on your team get to speak up at that time as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually ended up showing a couple different people um, how to log on to the ADP system to, to check that. Um, and actually, it, at one point, went to our accounts payable person to get some clarification on on when the PTO is dumped in and so they can know up to the minute, like, how much they've got. Um, so, yeah, I mean, other people, I, I gave everybody a chance to ask questions about anything in that meeting that day. Um, but there were a couple other questions answered. Now I've got, we haven't even got a problem and they're all logging on pretty regularly to check their stuff now. So. Did, any, did anyone on your team share with the individual that, that took the time off without authorization uh, that had to work shorthanded? Did any of them share what it was like for them? Oh yeah. Yeah, that okay. was, oh yeah. Um, that wasn't a, that part of it, actually you just brought back like nightmares of that meeting actually. I forgot about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, it got pretty tense there for a few minutes and it, and it was brought up and, and kind of expressed to that person. So I, I think they, um, they, they knew at that point. Um, but, uh, like I said, we haven't had a problem problem since then. So, yeah. So the, the thing of it is, well, very uncomfortable at the time. If you think about that slide I had, let's see if I can find it real, uh, just went out of my, this slide here for group and community cure anxiety goes up just like you were describing uh, but the fear of separation goes down because you're dealing with it yeah. and and everybody's sharing uh, what their expectations were so uh, hats off to you for doing that a as a group uh, thank you for sharing that with us how about the balsam for gang um, okay, so they wouldn't let me add up the years I was married total, just to the person I'm married to now. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So, <laughs> so, so, you, so you're a double <laughs> double uh, winner today as well, huh? So bingo. Okay. Yes. I'm not only the youngest friend. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. okay. So, um, what well, we decided that we didn't want to hear the word COVID again, so we decided to talk about uh, some dietary issues. <laughs> okay. So um, Sam shared with us a few things that go that kind of happen in dietary, which, um, you know, just different things like um, getting diet orders incorrectly, getting them from the physician through the nurse to actually the patient. And then another thing was food preparation. You know, there's a lot that goes into that, you know, a certain sequence of getting things out at a proper time, cooking things. So we kind of stuck with dietary things. And um, so a couple of the issues were, um, you know, the meal preparation. And that kind of, um, then we talked about also, is this an individual person that is the issue? Or is this a group issue? You know, so if it was an individual issue, like the person who was responsible, that's who you know, Sam would probably start with, hey, you know, you're supposed to get the meat out. Now it's not defrosted. Now everybody gets fish sticks, you know, or is it a group thing? You know, like, is it a, a whole thing? Everybody's not doing this. So she kind of uh, takes it by what it is. If it's an individual, you know, she would talk to the individual. If it's group, she would talk to the group. One instance that she gave us was with the diet orders. You know, is it one particular physician that never puts it in or is it the group of physicians or nurses, you know, and then how would we solve it if it was one physician, she would talk to them. If she was having a lot of trouble with the nursing staff, perhaps she'd go to an IDT meeting or talk to Amy, you know, so we kind of talked through those two situations with the diet orders and the food preparation, you know, so. And she thought education sometimes with the physician, the nursing staff, um, you know, the patient says they want a piece of pie, they have a thousand calorie diet, they're low salt, they're low sugar, the nurse says yes, dietary says no, the patient says yes, you know. Um, 
how she's had to work through some of those things in her department. And um, it was kind of interesting to hear some of the things that, um, you know, were issues in other departments besides nursing. Yes. You know? Yeah. You mean you guys aren't the only ones that have issues? Well, I'm glad we did. <laughs> I'm glad somebody else does. Cause... Yes. So, I mean, the, just going through this, these four questions, are your expectations clear? What can you do to help? Do you need to come up with new ideas and review processes and then a plan of action? Um, and then, you know, how are you going to address it? One on one? You know, I think Sam has really clear expectations in her department because it is a well run department. And how does she help? She talks to her staff daily, she gives them verbal reminders, she educates. And when we got to the part about brainstorm and process, she said she's had to change some of the processes so things were like done more efficiently. And um, I think she has a, a good team down there, you know, um, and I think she works with them very well. Um, so she lets the assembly line workers uh, sort out how to put those parts on and not yeah. just let the engineers tell them how to do it? I think as long as it's effective, going effectively, there's not an issue. Yes, You know, Wonderful. And that's kind of how she handles stuff. And I think that's well respected. Yes, know. very good. Thank you for sharing that with us. How about the uh, balsam fir team? That was us. Oh, that was you? Oh, I didn't check you off my list. Sorry. Uh, I guess that just leaves white pine, my favorite tree, white pine. I got picked for this one. I've been married the least amount of years. All right. And congratulations. Thank you. Um, we, it was uh, Lisa and Amy and myself, and we all kind of talked about different scenarios that we've encountered. Uh, one uh, thing that Lisa brought up was a staff member um, and a, about cleaning a piece of equipment and how they did it a certain way at another facility that this person worked at, but we do it a different way here at Marshall Browning. And as far as um, her being clear about her expectations, she said probably not, um, but you know, one term she uses was she should have interjected instead of accepted, but it would have been done correctly. Um, and um, so she's going to, you know, talk about the processes that we do here at Marshall Browning instead of other facilities and make sure they do the education that they're supposed to have. Um, on Amy, is, um, it was a, a disciplinary uh, issue where, you know, she spoke to the employee and she also spoke to the, the providers and other staff members. Um, you know, of course, the expectations should be very clear on med surge. This is the way you take care of the patients, and this is, you know, you do it correctly in order to, to for things to be safe. Um, she, you know, did a one on one addressing with that employee, but she also, I guess, in a sense, did it as a group uh, discussion when she talked to the other the providers and the other staff members involved. And that, you know, ultimately, you know, ended up with a termination because of you know, the, the, uh, the way that the patients were being taken care of was not acceptable for us. Um, in my scenario, um, it's one of those where I thought I had been clear about my expectations, but maybe I needed to be a little bit clearer, or maybe I need to remind that person about the expectations. Um, I have asked them, you know, how can I help them? What can I do to help them, to help them understand you know, the, the process is that there's a specific way things have to be done because it affects other people on the back end of our process that we do. Um, so I need to um, work on that, talk to that person. And it's, it's more of a one on one um, thing because it just, it between me and another person. But I need to, uh, as far as build a plan of action, I need to sit down and talk to that person again about the specific process and remind that person how it affects other departments in the long run. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for sharing that. 
So we heard a lot of different scenarios, some common themes with some of them, some unique things uh, from others. And so if we go back to, to Kurt's example where uh, they had the individual uh, was addressed as the whole team was a part of that, right? And what's interesting is that when addressing it as a team, as a group, as a community cure as the words I use here, um, it helps with the, the questions at the top of the checklist about expectations. What can be done to help? Do we need to review the processes or do we even need to change some of the processes like we're uh, the example uh, in dietary? And uh, is there a plan of action in place when this is all done? So the, once again, the majority of the uh, way of addressing situations as described by all of you was the one-on-one -on -one scenario. I get that. And all I would like to throw out there for your consideration is to think about how you can deal with issues as a group, as a team, as a community cure. Think about that. It's going to push you out of your comfort zone, uh, but it will also help build the level of engagement of your team if you can do that in the right situation. So um, I just throw that out there as a challenge. So today we've kind of walked through the history of accountability going from the, we've traveled in time from the Roman Empire to current day events at Marshall Browning Hospital uh, in this process. Uh, the one thing I would ask you to do, uh, the next time we get together, we're going to talk about goal setting, and that's two weeks from today. So I want to throw out the idea of between now and then, using that accountability checklist on a situation where you need to hold someone accountable. And then if anyone's willing to share their experience when we get back on the call in two weeks, uh, that would be awesome. Any Bill, are you there? Okay. I thought the freezing was on my end. Did we lose him? I think we lost him. Darn. Well, the good thing is Bill's contact information is on the screen. <laughs> if anybody has a question or was there, if there's anything that you'd like to talk through with Bill, I know he um, would be happy to, to talk through that with you. So yeah, so our next session is two weeks from today, um, talking about goal setting and um, we will get the recording of this as well as the, the assignment that Bill just gave out um, to Heather to distribute before the next session. So thanks everybody. We know it's a really hard time. We're thinking about all of you. We're here to support you in any way that we can. So have a wonderful day and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye.